when I was doing my investigations into how the brain works from a neuropsychological perspective, and that was informed a lot by Jeffrey Gray, who we're going to talk about later, one of the things I noticed was that you don't actually, you don't actually see things when you first see something. In fact, when you first see something, you don't even see it. You react to it. You react to it with your body. So I can give you an example. So you, you're, you have a partner and you, you have a trusting relationship and then you find out that they're, you know, they tell you or you figure out from their phone or something they're having an affair. And you look at them and you think, well, what do you see? And you think, you see, well, you see the person. It's like, no, you don't. You do not see the person. That's wrong. What you see is a huge pit that you're going to fall into. And you don't even know you see it, but your body knows. As your blood pressure goes through the roof and your heart starts to pound and you sweat. And the reason for that is your body sees what you can't see. And what it sees is something it seriously does not understand. It does not understand it. It sees the territory behind the map. Right? Because when I look at you, for all intents and purposes, really what I'm looking at is my presuppositions about you. And because you're polite and well behaved, you're gracious enough to act in accordance with those presuppositions so I don't even really have to look at you. And thank you very much for that. Because it's very difficult to look at people because they're horrifying and profound creatures. And so everybody walks around behaving so we don't terrify the hell out of each other all the time. Now, when someone betrays you, it's like, poof, presupposition's gone. Okay, what's there? Well, God only knows. And that's what your body reacts to. And that's partly why the phenomenologist said, we react to meaning first. We don't react to the object. It takes a long time to see the damn object. So, for example, let's say that your person has betrayed you. Now, you think you knew who they were. And you thought you knew who you were. Ha! Guess what? You're wrong. You don't know who they are. And because you're such a moron, that means you don't know who you are. And it means you can't trust any of your memories with that person. And maybe none of your memories in any intimate relationships at all. Plus, what about the future? Well, so when you look at the person, what do you see? You see all that. It's like chaos. Whack. That's what you see. And that chaos is the meaning behind your presuppositions. And that's why the phenomenologist would say, Meaning shines forth. That's phanes thai. It shines forth. And that's the primary thing we encounter. It's like, that's smart. And you know what's really weird? That's how your damn brain is organized. And that's weird, eh? Because you think, let's think about it. How do you define reality? Now that's a tough one. So I would say most of you define reality like your Isaac Newton. Or maybe like your Democritus, who was the first person who hypothesized atoms. And so in the Newtonian world, it's like billiard ball world, right? Everything is made out of little billiard balls and they bang together in a causal way and you can predict the consequences of their banging together. And if you extend it enough, you can conjure up an entirely deterministic world. A happens, causes B, B causes C, always the same way and everything runs like a giant clock. That's Newton's model, and, it's, and it was a clock model because, you know, back at that time, clocks, man, those things were pretty damn impressive. Clocks got the whole industrial revolution underway, and, you know, medieval cities would put an awful lot of time and work into their clocks, and they thought those damn things were really cool. You know, they could keep track of where the planets were moving. It's like, that's a big deal, a clock, and, and if you want to think about an invention that changed the world, it's like the clock's a big one. Now we can measure time. In the same way, everyone can measure time. It's a big deal. So the idea that the universe is like a clock, given that the clock can predict the universe, it's a pretty damn powerful idea. Turns out that it's wrong because, you know, causality is a mess. No one really understands it. And there are levels of analysis at which causality, just in the way we experience it, doesn't seem to imply, apply at all. You go down to the subatomic level, it's probabilistic. You can't predict single events. And I don't believe that you can predict the future. You can predict parts of the future in an extremely limited way for some purposes, for some span of time, that, and you can't even predict how long that span of time is going to last. You know, and some things seem to be more stable across more situations and more times than others, but there's still, there's instability everywhere, and it makes it predicting things a very difficult thing to do. So, okay, so... That's one idea about reality. That's the idea really that you have. And that's the reality that you've been educated to have. 
the idea of reality you've been educated to have. Even though we know it's wrong, like it, Einstein blew that world up in the early 1900s along with the various people that Einstein depended on. That's gone. It's wrong. And then there's all sorts of other extremely complicated problems like how to model positive feedback loops. You know, that sort of gets you into chaos theory and it's really, really hard to model positive feedback loops and they can go wild in 50 different ways and you can't really predict them because they depend on initial conditions and, and so on and so forth. So, so the deterministic world, it's like, no, that's wrong. I think part of the reason we have to have free will is because we can't act deterministically. You know, a deterministic system is only going to work in a system that stays the same, you know, so you can wind up a little clock, you know, one of those little clockwork toys and it'll walk. But, you know, if you put a cliff in front of it, it just walks off the cliff. So and cliffs are appearing in front of us randomly all the time. So I can't even see how a deterministic system could possibly work to guide us. It would assume that our knowledge, the knowledge that we derive from the past, is sufficiently accurate to causally guide us into the future. It's like, no, that's not right. It doesn't. That maybe that's why we have consciousness. No one knows, but that's a good theory, if there's a why. Anyways, here's an alternative. The alternative. This is a Darwinian alternative. So here's the alternative. The world's a complex and dynamic place. It's full of weird things. Basically, it's made up of patterns. It's made up of patterns and patterns of patterns and patterns and patterns of patterns. And that's what it is. And they shift and dance around. And then you throw something that's alive into that. It's, it's programmed by DNA. And the damn thing has to keep up with the patterns. And they're changing all the time. Some of them are kind of stable, but they're pretty damn fluid. So then you throw the DNA in there, and it goes and produces a million variants of whatever it's going to produce. And most of them are wrong. So you're a mosquito. You lay a million lay eggs. It's like, so that's a million bets about how the future will causally unfold. And the bet is, the future's gonna unfold so this egg can turn into a mosquito. And so then you might say, well, how often is the mosquito that lays the eggs wrong? And the answer to that is, if it, if it lays a million eggs in its lifetime, I don't know how many eggs mosquitoes lay, but they lay a lot. All of those eggs are gonna die except one, if the mosquito's lucky. And you know that because we're not knee deep in mosquitoes, right? If, if it wasn't the case, then there'd just be mosquitoes everywhere, and there aren't, thank God. There's enough of the damn things, but, you know. So basically, what's the bet? The bet is mosquito matches environment. Answer, wrong, except once in a million. So how do you overcome that? Million mosquitoes, million eggs, and it'll do the trick. And so look, that's so interesting, eh? Because it means the fundamental hypothesis that the mosquito structure matches the structure of reality is wrong at a, one in a million, it's wrong at a 999,999 level of error. You might just think that's just completely wrong. No, that's really wrong, but it keeps the damn mosquitoes going. Okay, so then this propagates across time, you know, and what really propagates across time is a massive wave of death. Virtually everything fails. 99.9% .9 of the species that ever lived are extinct, it's something like that. You know, and we're doing a fair good job of making sure that a good chunk of the ones that exist now are going to go extinct. You know, so failure and death is the norm and it's going to happen to all of you.